All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a special collaboration between me and uh, Stephen Van Camp and Lewis. Today, we're going to be talking about Calia species, but even more importantly, we're going to be talking about Calia species that bloom in different seasons around the year. So the idea here is that if you really love Calia species, you can have one in bloom or at least in bud pretty much every month of the year. Wouldn't you say so, Stephen? Yeah, for sure. Um, this is you know, this is not something that I've consciously thought about as I've purchased my my orchid collection over the years. But yeah, there is, you know, it is nice to have something blooming uh, just about all year round. And, you know, a lot of the, the, the hybrids will actually bloom throughout the year, but, you know, today we're just going to focus on, on the species. Um, and, and I actually do want to say that Art Chadwick has a really good lecture about this very topic um, that happened this spring. Oh, really? And it's Yeah, yeah. It's on the, the AOS, um, uh, their webinar series. So um, you guys can go check that out there. But, you know, Art Chadwick is not the only person in the world who's interested in species and having them bloom all year round. So uh, we'll chat about it today. Cool. Um, so uh, the I guess the first thing we're going to look at is, well, first of all, do you have any, uh, how many Calia species are there? Like there's a lot, right? There's Ooh, dozens put, and dozens. There's not hundreds. The Let, let's just say dozens and dozens, dozens and leave it there's back. a lot well i guess the reason i brought that up not to put you on the spot or my, myself on the spot either was just to say that there's a lot and we can't talk about them all mm -hmm. so we've exactly. kind of made a list of cali species that just kind of off the top of our heads that we know bloom in certain seasons and then um of course steven you've been growing catlias for a very long time you've grown a lot of these yourself yeah 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 i've i've, I've grown yeah, exactly. Uh, a bunch of these over the past, I don't know, three decades that I've been growing, I guess. Uh, it's a lot of decades. Yeah. I mean, clearly I'm only 30 years old. I, <laughs> I started growing the day I was born. So right. uh, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> You've aged remarkably. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, I've, I've grown one or two Catlia species as well. So I'll be able to chime in a little bit. But uh, I think, uh, Stephen, I might actually have more questions than answers in this in this talk. So hopefully you can help us out with that. Definitely. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, we're going to bring up a graphic now. And so this graphic is just something that uh, Stephen and I put together that basically shows the four seasons and a short list of Calia species that bloom typically in those seasons but and they, they, don't, they don't always necessarily bloom in those seasons but i think it's a pretty it's a pretty good guide wouldn't wouldn't you agree yeah it's it's a it's an approximation um you know it's uh it's, and it really focuses on on the more common species that we we have and and, and is certainly not exhaustive of all the dozens and dozens and dozens of species that are out there but um the handy thing about this list is it's ones that a we've we've grown uh, and that you and I have photos of, and so we can kind of talk a, a little bit more in depth about some of these. Uh, you know, maybe we'll chat for e about each one for a couple minutes. You know, okay, and, and show some show some pictures for for everyone to see. Right, and we're definitely going to kind of highlight our favorites out of this list as well. And it's like picking your favorite kid. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and start with, shall we start with spring? Yeah, might as well. Okay, um, let's do it. Yeah, you know, spring is, is I think, a lot of the time when, when people think about cat, Catlea species blooming, they really think about the, the spring species and, and maybe the fall species. But, you know, like this whole discussion is about you, you can have these uh, year round. And before we jump into it, there's a lot of these that um, while we're going to talk about them as blooming mostly in one season or the other a lot of these especially with the, the more mature plants will bloom uh multiple times per year some are very seasonal some will bloom kind of whenever they feel like it whenever and, they feel like it and so you know we're going to start with cattleya ludimaniana um this is a, a primarily venezuelan species that grows in uh pretty dry hot conditions very bright it, it's uh desert ish out there um, and, um, but you don't need to replicate that in, in your own home. You can, you can grow this one alongside your, your bifoliates or your unifoliates. 
Um, this one is a unifoliate, and it, it's it's got one that's uh, you know just this. It's really well known for for being a, a, a large petals and sepals, and just the most intensely colored lip. Um, and it, it it is it is really cool. Oh, you got one, you got one with a really nice lip on it, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I've got a nice dark one, and then I've been collecting some some other ones as of late. Uh, for some reason, the the rubra bug has really hit me, and and Ludimaniana has some just amazing rubras out there um so uh, really strong red really almost red like a vibrant yeah so so uh you know an albescens is is sort of an almost white and that's the reduction of the dark pigment to the point where you almost can't see it this is the reverse this is there's too much pigment too much pigment uh in the flower and it and it just turns it this brilliant fire red um, and there's a lot of species that have rubras, and, and Ludimania has a really nice one. Cool. Um, but, you know, this one's pretty bulletproof as far as if you're going to cut your teeth on Cattleya species, this one and the next one we'll talk about are, are really, really the way to go. And, and they're, they're both spring bloomers. Um, and Ludimaniana on, under lights, I've actually got a friend here uh, in Texas who's, who's blooming hers right now. Um, and it's, you know, the middle of summer, but she grows under lights uh, in more controlled conditions. Oh, I see. So it didn't get that, maybe that seasonal change. Yeah. Not so much yeah. under lights indoors. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> All right. Let's go to this guy that's uh, used to be a Lelia, but now I guess that's not the case anymore. Yeah. I, I still, in my mind, it's still Lelia purpurata, but, uh, you know, I, I have changed my tags. I am a big fan of updating and, and staying relevant with the new taxonomy. Um, but yeah, Cattleya purpurata is um, a really cool spring blooming, it's sort of a late blo spring blooming species, um, so it can kind of bleed into to, to early summer there. Um, and there's, there's a lot of different varieties. This is, this is, like I said earlier, this is another one of those bulletproof species. Um, it can take temperatures down pretty close to freezing, and it can take temperatures, I mean, I, I think it's 105 where I'm at right now, and it, mm. it, it does just fine. They get pretty um, darn big, don't, don't they? I, I think I've seen you with a picture, you're holding it, and it's like as big as your whole upper body. Yeah, and that's that's the lowland uh, uh, form or race, actually. There's, there's two different ones. There's a, a lowland form that is, you know, big, big, big plants. Uh, but there's a smaller one. The highland form uh, is quite a bit smaller. Um, and, and, you know, the one that I'm holding in my arms, uh, this, that was me growing in Hawaii when I lived on the island of Oahu. And that particular one, um, it, it would bloom. You could set a calendar by the exact date nearly that it would bloom year after year after year. Wow. And that was the only time it would bloom. Next to it, I had a little highland one that bloomed five times for me in a year and a half and just oh, wow. bloomed basically – you know, once a quarter almost. And so, you know, not only do some species uh, bloom re uh, repeatedly throughout the year, uh, some there, there are some differences where that particular plant is from. Mm. Um, you know, the high, like I said, the highland form was blooming regularly. The, my lowland form was blooming very regularly once a year. Um, but this one is from, from uh, sort of the Southern part of Brazil and, and, and uh, like I said, it gets a lot more variable temperatures and is, is fairly easy. You can grow it uh, without any particularly special conditions uh, compared to your, your other cat layers and grow, grow alongside those guys. A little big bit more flowers. forgiving. Yeah, very forgiving. Big flowers, big plant if you get the lowland uh, race. Um, but uh, it, it's, got a, it's got a kind of a compact growth habit so that, you know, between growths, it's it's fairly compact. So uh, a good sized pot can accommodate a large mature plant. So it'll get tall, but it won't but you'll necessarily. Have a, it'd be dense as well. Exactly. And it has a pretty nice fragrance too. It smells like like the cereal Fruit Loops. It does. It, to my nose, it smells like Fruit Loops. Um, everybody's nose seems to be a little different, but um, I, I I just love it. Absolutely love it. Nice. All right, our last spring bloomer we're going to talk about here. This is a bifoliate Cattleya. I've never grown a bifoliate. I've just seen your videos on th that they are a little bit tougher to grow. But uh, tell us about Cattleya amethystoglossa. Uh, yeah, amethystoglossa is um, a really cool bifoliate. And unlike the two that we just mentioned, it is a little trickier to grow, uh, like a lot of the bifoliates. Um, it, it likes hot, 
conditions, uh, bright conditions. You can grow it alongside your other cattleyas. Um, this one, what makes it tricky is repotting. Um, you need to do it as the new roots are, are coming out. If you repot a bifoliate, there's a good chance to kill it within that, that next year. So you can't just repot them whenever. Um, and you will repot it as the new growth, the, the new leaves of the new growth are just starting to get differentiated. So the new growth will be about this tall. And then you'll see that flusher roots come out. And that's when you can cut it and or just repot it. Um, but the blooms on this one are, are really cool. Uh, sort of a, a, a round uh, pink, typically bright pink lip with a lot of polka dots. They're um, a little thicker, a little bit more substance to it, a little waxier are. maybe. Yeah, they're they're very plasticky, uh, especially the lip. If you take that lip, it's it's very bumpy, uh, and, and very plasticky. Uh, there's cerulea varieties, alba varieties. There's a golden variety. Um, the polyploids. I, I made a whole video about how the diploids, the two end plants, are you know probably about this tall above the pot, whereas the polyploids are monsters, three four feet tall. Um, and, and you can get those. H and R orchids is primarily the, my main source for uh, the amethyst glosses and specifically the polyploid amethyst glosses. Nice. Yeah. And they smell good too. They 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 smell. I like the smell. I've had other people say they don't like the smell, so it's not it's not that universal cat okay. smell that everybody loves. Um, but uh, they're 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 great. I I really enjoy them. Cool. All right. Well, we've got several other spring bloomers, but let's move on to the summer bloomers. And uh, uh, we've got a few that we're talking about here. It looks like the first one are, well, did we have anything to say about any of the other summer bloomers before we get into the general, uh, the, the three no, we're going to talk no, about? No, I think, I think the, the spring bloomers are, are you know, uh, like I said, the, the ones that a lot of folks think about when they think about cattleyas, um, you know, the corsage orchids, of course, were for for, for springtime and, and a lot of those unifoliate cattleyas and their hybrids were, were bred specifically to bloom in spring. Um, but there's a bunch of summer ones too. Yeah. In fact, you are now one of the nation's experts on growing uh, <laughs> this particular summertime hybrid. And it's just yeah. really cool. Well, it's funny because I talked to Arthur Chadwick about Cattleya Rex, which is the next one we're going to talk about. And um, he said that they weren't that common because they never really got swept up in that whole corsage orchid thing mm -hmm. because there weren't ever really any holidays around the time that it bloomed. So, um, and apparently there haven't just, there haven't been that many around for a long time as well. Um, but anyway, I thought that was interesting. So yeah, Cattleya Rex, it blooms in the summer. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting because, you know, Cattleya's in different, that bloom in different seasons might have similar growth habits, but then they just decide to put out their bloom spikes at different, uh, different times of year, right? Like Cattleya Rex starts to put out its leads in late winter. Those growths mature, and as those growths are just starting to mature, the the blooms come out, and it's in flower while the sh the leaf is still kind of pushing out of the sheath. Okay. What about and, the roots? Uh, when do, when do that come? When do they come out? When do they root? Okay, so that's great. If it doesn't, if it's not going to bloom, the roots will start pushing out just as that leaf is kind okay. of completing its shape. But yeah. if it blooms, it holds off on putting out roots until the blooms are done. Oh, interesting. And that's something I just learned in the past year that i just kind of paid attention to i was like why are all these rooting and you're not rooting and it's and it was just like well i'm blooming so leave me alone you know? <laughs> yeah. but Hold yeah sure, sure enough the ones that that bloomed those those are you know long gone but they've they've put out but i don't think they put out quite as many roots as the ones that that didn't bloom yet so it's it's still figuring out how that works so it's it's kind of like in a bifoliate in that if you kind of mess up with the plant during that really critical root growing period you could seriously set it back yeah you're screwed yeah interesting it's funny and and i've been looking around to see if some of them are more mm, active rooters like more likely to and i've noticed some of them did kind of root all winter long and others were just like they just kind of crossed their arms and they're like no i'm not doing it <laughs> so huh, yeah it's interesting. interesting and i think that's one thing that's just it, it's worth mentioning to people who are new-ish to Catlia species they have different times of year that not only do they bloom at certain times of year but also certain times of year they grow and certain times of year they root so if you disrupt that or if something happens where the roots all get torn off right after it makes them you got to wait a year in some cases before you're going to get to see the plant try to make new roots in and general you gotta, 
you got to hope that the, the plant can survive that that year yeah but yeah. i would also say a lot of the species are are tough you know i mean they're meant to live in the wild where they don't have someone doting over them and watering them every day so um i've been surprised at how tough they are as well that's cool um the what does the catlea rex smell like is com- compared to other catleas um i haven't uh the rex itself smells like roses to me it's okay. not really strong like you can't get it real close at least mm-hmm. my plants should do but um they do have a nice you know, kind of a light rose fragrance yeah, no, it's nice. I'm hoping that with subsequent bloomings it gets stronger, but yeah. we'll see. Very cool. All right, the our next, next uh, summer bloomer. Now you're gonna have to help me pronounce this guy. Yeah, this is a lot of GZI, um, and, and a lot of GZI is is a bifoliate. I, I would say of the bifoliates, it's it's one of the more uh, um, easier to grow, uh, more forgiving. Um, you know, I've got uh, one that is, is, has matured a bulb. I've got a big mature plant and it's got a mature bulb. And I hope to see, I thought I saw some, some buds starting to form in that sheath and it's also growing a new growth right now. Um, but again, you know, hot, uh, this one will grow next to your, your other cat layers. Um, it is, uh, it's not quite as temperature tolerant uh, on the cold side as, um, uh, as purpurata is, or, or the one that we're, we're about to talk about. Um, but uh, it's it, it's still fairly bulletproof. And uh, if you want to cut your teeth on, on one of the bifoliates, this this might be a good one. Okay. Um, and it's it, it's great. It's, you know, the, the one that I have has flowers that are like this big and just neon pink. And um, I, I've got a, a flask that I'm growing up, you know, and they're, they're out of flask now. I, I unflasked them about a year and a half ago. And they're... Uh, so the, my mature plant is about this tall-ish. I'm a fisherman, so it's actually this tall. Um, but the the ones out of flask, I've got one that's this tall and already has a sheath. So oh, it's, you're kidding. It's uh, it's uh, it wants to flower. It wants to bloom, which is really cool. Um, nothing particularly tricky about this one that I can think of. Um, the, the fragrance is nice, and it, it's nice to have blooms in, in the dead of summer. Um, when, when the world is, is steamy and hot, you know, so. <laughs> Good deal. And uh, uh, I'm trying to think, we haven't talked about how long the blooms last on many of these. That's but a, I would think that those both bifolias, because they're, they're thicker, waxier blooms, maybe they last a little longer. The, that's that's a good point. The um, amethystic gloss is probably about three weeks. Uh, a lot of GZI was... Uh, I think last year I had mine for about a month. So it was a great, nice, long bloom. Yeah, and in um, the heat of summer, that's really awesome. Yeah, that's really nice. Uh, you know, the, the the springtime bloomers we talked about, the Ludimaniana and Purpurata are, are three weeks as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Rex, and, my Rexes have bloomed. They last about two weeks, but I'm hoping that in subsequent bloom we can get more time out of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as the, as the plants get older, you'll get more blooms, and hopefully they last longer, and hopefully they have a, a stronger fragrance. Mm, totally. Yeah. All right. Now, our next orchid that's a summer bloomer, it's uh, very, very popular in Brazil. In fact, you were telling me that there are entire orchid societies dedicated just to this species. Is Catlia uh, intermedia? Intermedia is very popular in Brazil, as is Purpurata. Both of these species have their own societies and shows dedicated to just that species. Uh, both of them have so many color varieties that it, it's actually, you know, it's possible you're not going to have a whole bench or a whole show of one colored flower. You're going to have all these different flowers and different shapes. And um, intermediate is probably the most bulletproof of all the ones we're talking about today. This one will really? take temperatures down to freezing. Um, you can grow them in here in Texas in, in the summertime heat. Um and you know they they grow them outside fairly regularly in in uh, coastal California again where where it can dip below freezing occasionally at night um, with no problem and uh, you know the, like I said that this one is a lot of color varieties um, you know Sergio Garcia the owner of Olum Poly Orchid spoke to us in June I think it was on uh, on just this species and and his entire lecture was basically going over the majority of the color varieties. He is Brazilian. This is his favorite species. And it was really cool to see him talk and, and talk about, I mean, there, there's a whole 
the, there's a whole naming system just for the color varieties of this one and and he's talking about you know you go into some of these these shows and, and these color varieties that kind of overlap and you'll get you'll get guys fighting each other about <laughs> what it's called and uh it's it's, it's really cool what's i think and I've, i'm starting to really understand this like if you do specialize in just one or two species i feel like your success can be so much greater because you just can get those if you get the right plants that are going to flourish under your conditions and then you just really focus on those you it's uh takes a, takes out a lot of the headaches i think yeah yeah especially if you, if your conditions are perfectly suited to to i mean intermediate like i said anyone can grow it at any any place basically um but yeah you know if you're passionate about one or two species man that makes your life a whole heck of a lot easier because you know what to expect when how to deal with it um or or you know you can kind of specialize i i think i've personally i've specialized down to basically mostly cattleyas and catacetums and and you know, I just like every other hobbyist out there, I want to buy all this other stuff and I want to have it in my collection. And I, you know, heck, I just got a bunch of bulba films from Bill Tom. So, oh, nice. Um, but, but specializing is, is, it can be a very good idea. Yeah. And, uh, flower size and fragrance, real quick on intermediate before we move on to autumn. Uh, flower size, they're, they're a little smaller, uh, probably like this big. Um, fragrance, I, I can't remember off the top of my head. I don't remember it being particularly, amazing okay um, not one you really think of fragrance when you think of it yeah 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 i mean when you think of fragrance you kind of think of doyana or or uh, uh tigrina or some of these other intensely wakariana which we'll talk about in a moment cool yeah all right yeah so let's move on to our fall bloomers autumn bloomers uh our list is starting to get a little bit shorter because it's looking like that the autumn and the winter bloomers there's just there seems to be fewer of them but yeah yeah, there, there's, there's, you know, the more commonly grown ones, um, you know, the cut flower trade back in the day, of course, really uh, was heavily influenced by this particular species, Cattleya labiata. Um, it is a fall bloomer. It does have that sort of um, traditional corsage shape um, flower, uh, big, you know, frilly, lots of colors. You can get albas and rubras and semi-albas where you've got the, the petals and sepals are white and the lip is dark, uh, ceruleas. And um, it, this is a fairly easy growing orchid, fairly um, uh, not fussy. Uh, it can grow like, you know, alongside any of your other, your cattleyas. And um, I don't think you're going to want to take it down to freezing like you can with, with some of the other species we've, we've spoken about, but um, that, you know, getting down to the forties is, is not a problem if your plant is dry. Um, and I, this was, is, I believe Labiata was one of the first big fluffy cattleyas that was discovered, right? It was kind of like the, this is the, the one. It was like. It was. It was the one that really kicked off the cattleya craze. And then it was lost for like 50 years. I think they couldn't find it. Um, and so then they found it again, of course. And and, um, and it just really accelerated the uh, the the cattleya craze in the, the late 1800s or, or early 1900s when it was found again, I, I can't remember the exact dates, but then the, the cut flower trade uh, was really heavily influenced by this one because it is a fall bloomer and um, there are events that people want to have a corsage orchid for in, in right. fall. So, And I'm not mistaken, this species is actually like photo period sensitive. So you can make it bloom by shortening the day and and that's been very useful to the flower trade because they can kind of control that and then get them to bloom whenever they need need them to yeah yeah you, you can um you can do that uh, I, I know it's done significantly uh or a lot of the time with um, phalaenopsis in taiwan and some of these other places that just have acres and acres of phalaenopsis i don't know that anybody's necessarily doing that with labiata anymore um but it, it you know the the photo period uh, influence is, is is important to getting these guys to bloom, which actually, uh, that's a good point. If, if you're growing under lights and you've got a 12 hour day all year round, you might, you might have trouble um, <clears throat> getting some of these guys to bloom. So it, it's, it's important to, to have your timer set on your light so that, you know, 
maybe in, uh, in middle of December, you've got a 10 hour day. And then maybe this time of the year, you've got a 14 hour day and then sort of adjust uh, throughout the year with your lights. So you have your lights there. kind of more or less mm, follow the, the, the sun. You can extend the day a little bit, but make yeah. sure you have a shorter day in the winter and a longer day in the summer. Exactly. That, that uh, photo periodicity uh, is important for, for a lot of these species and a lot of cat, uh, not just cat layers, but a lot of orchids in general. All right. Okay, let's move on down to Calium maxima. I read recently it was uh, it was actually described pretty early on in uh, the period of discovery, and uh, they named it maxima because you know at that time it had some of the largest flowers that they had seen. But there were so many more catlias they hadn't discovered yet that it didn't end up being maxima. Actually, didn't end up being that big. I I want to say that. I can't remember if Maxima was named Maxima because of the large size of the flowers or the, it might be the plant. The plants uh, too were pretty big. Cause the, 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 this is, this is another one that has a lowland and a highland uh, race. Uh, the lowland race has these monster plants that can just be gigantic. Um, and then the highland race is, is fairly compact and will bloom kind of whenever it wants. Uh, a lot like that, that purpurata uh, that I had that bloomed five times in a year and a half. I'm um, I'm, so, I'm certainly seeing that now. I just got a Maxima uh, a few months ago, and uh, it went ahead and bloomed a few weeks ago. The flowers have lasted about three weeks so far. There looks like they're starting to see some brown patches on them. So okay, still three weeks, not bad. It's got and a nice a floral bloom? fragrance. It's about <laughs> this big across. What is yeah. that? Five inches, something like that. Um, but yeah, they're re they're really nice, and it's got two sheaths coming, so it's it looks like it's going to bloom into the fall. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And Maxima is a, a great one. It's very hardy as well. Um, it has the really intricate patterning on the lip. There's a lot of color varieties. Uh, I, I know you've got the cerulea, which is one of the ones that a lot of folks uh, are able to collect. the The typical one is sort of a lavender with, like I said, that in intensely. Um, pattern lip uh the petals and sepals can be a little reflexed and it can be it's not yeah it's, it's kind of like, like the drunken uncle of the uh -huh. catlea family yeah it's not gonna be that nice flat showy flower it's i mean it's very showy but it's not gonna be you know it's not the the normal corsage catlea shape and, and frilliness um and it is it is a, is a it is one of my favorites actually it's, it's a really great one and apparently it's pretty pretty tough and not that not that picky, which is mm -hmm. always a plus. Yeah, yeah, easy to grow. Uh, this is considered a unifoliate, and um, yeah, it's fairly fairly common. You can you can get these at a lot of uh, nurseries. All right, okay, let's move on to uh, one of your favorites for sure, Calia yeah. Walkeriana. Yeah, Walkeriana is a great little little short statured plant big fat squatty bulbs and, and sort of big round leaves um this one grows in some of the drier parts of brazil and this one is uh some people consider uh, kind of finicky it's going to want really bright light like really bright light uh, it loves the heat um it is temperature tolerant on the cold side as well it, it can freeze in its in its native habitat and so it will take um cold temperatures in addition to hot ones um, but it is, uh, you know, it, it's a unifoliate in that it has one leaf, but it sort of grows like a bifoliate and it grows a lot like it's nobili or cousin, where if you repot it at the wrong time, um, it'll get very angry with you and, and might die. Uh, it wants to drain very quickly, maybe a little more quickly than some of these other cattleyas. And yeah, they need um, to dry really quickly. Um, I've got mine, the one you sent me, I've got growing in rocks, you know, and it's, it's, and it's still, I, I it's wish it great, would right? get a little bit, uh. I wish it would dry out a little bit more before between waterings. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, I've got mine in sort of the hottest, brightest part of my backyard. Um, and uh, unlike Maxima, which has these kind of, like you said, drunken uncle flowers, these have, have the flat, wide um, flowers, intensely yeah. fragrant. Uh, you know, you you smell a Wakariana, and uh, at least for me, that that's really what got me hooked on this one. Um, is that fragrance and, and there's a lot of color varieties in fact I'll show a photo of, of uh, a rubra and an alba um, and, and they are siblings um, it's uh, Estrella da Colina by a sibling Estrella da Colina is um, I think it means star on the hill in, in Portuguese 
but this comes from the H and R breeding, and um, it's actually somewhat common when to have albas and rubras, so white and dark red, from the same um, uh, the same seed crossing. Pod. Yeah, yeah, from the same seed pod. Uh, because again, it's it's a mutation of that pigment. So you either have too much or too little. And for whatever reason, you can get both of them in the same pod. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm super excited. The flowers are just, you know, the, the, the ones, the awarded ones you see, they just are absolutely flat as a pancake, perfectly symmetrical, you know. Um, they're not huge flowers, right? No, they're, they're either, they're smaller than the unifoliates, um, but, you know, fairly firm. That lip's going to be fairly waxy and um, the column kind of looks like a nose and that's just rock hard. And that uh, um, lasts uh, quite a while as well. They do. They'll, they'll last a good three weeks. Um, they should be blooming uh, in the cooler part of the season. Um, but, you know, a, a really happy uh, Wakariana in, in Hawaii, for example. Um, I, I know Harry over at H&R over there gets his Wakarianas to bloom a couple times a year. Um, so m mine are fairly seasonal. His will bloom whenever. Um, really okay yeah so i'm getting excited in the next you know we'll say, give it six months or so if it's going to bloom we'd see it then hopefully i, I bet you'll get a, a new growth so this is one of those ones so all the ones we've talked about have the the flower spikes coming out of the top of the new growth wakariana actually will will send up new growths and then the flower will come out on a separate new growth which is is very odd um, and so you, let's hopefully, you know, around September, mid-September, if we see a new um, new growth coming out of yours, we'll, we'll watch it to see if it's a, 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 a new spike. And, um, you know, the new growths are very pointed. Uh, a spike will be a, sort of a, a blunted end of that, that new growth. So it's, it's I'll be fun. I'll be there with the ma uh, magnifying glass every day. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about uh, winter? Believe it or not, we have some cattleyas that bloom right around the winter solstice, right? Or is it a little bit later than that? Yeah, it is around that. Uh, Percivaliana is is in the northern hemisphere is often called the Christmas orchid because it'll it'll bloom around that time. Um, and uh, Percivaliana is interesting. It also comes from a, kind of a drier, more xeric area um, in South America, a lot like Ludimaniana. And um, so they'll, they'll want to grow fairly dry, kind of hot, but, you know, this, while in nature they grow hot and dry, you can put them next to your cattleyas and they'll do just fine. This, this particular species, in my opinion, smells horribly. Um, it, I would second that. Um, there's a very famous clone called Summit. Mm -hmm. And there was uh, one of the growers in the greenhouse uh, had... Uh, one that really nice tons of blooms and i was like "Ooh, i bet that smells great and i was like i smelled it a couple of times and i was like that can't be right <laughs> yeah it's, that's wait a minute um, it, i wouldn't say it smelled yeah it, i think it's right up it there was, with bulbos and, and it's it's not as putrid but it's not pleasant <laughs> which is bizarre yeah. yeah yeah for sure um but again this one that one's fairly easy you can grow it just like the rest of your your other ones yeah, and it's interesting because this, you know, even though these plants are blooming in different seasons, generally speaking, they're growing in the summer and they're resting in the winter, right? Uh, I would say most of them, that's true. Um, the bifoliates will actually keep growing all winter long if you keep watering them. Okay. Um, so my amethysta glosses all keep hitting them with water and they keep sending out uh, more growth. And that's, of course, having an extra season of growth means more flowers each year. So, you know, if, if you have the ability and, and temperatures aren't getting too cold for you, definitely push those bifoliates to, to keep growing all, all winter long, all year round. Mm, you're making me want one of those bifoliates. I'll have yeah. to think about that. <laughs> all right. And our last winter bloomer, we only had two on the list. And this one is Catlia triani, which I think is a very, very strong component in many of the hybrids that you see out there today. Yeah, yeah. Triony is known, uh, it is naturally a flat flower. Uh, it is naturally, uh, it has naturally good presentation on the spike. So, um, you know, it, it's, it looks like it is a unifoliate. It looks like a floofy unifoliate, especially the modern breeding. It, it looks like a complex hybrid. Um, but uh, even the, the jungle collected plants are, you know, not all of them, but a lot of them are show quality right, right out the gate. Um, oh, that's nice. I know yeah. the triony comes from Colombia. I believe it's their national flower. 
Yeah. And mm-hmm. you'll find lots of uh, color varieties of this one as well. And mm-hmm. the one that I bought at Car- Carter and Holmes just a couple months ago, it's just a seedling, but it's a clone of, uh, I guess they, they, they Marist him cloned this uh, awarded one from like 1939 called AC Barrage. Oh, wow. So it's like, okay, 1939. So yeah, apparently this one has just really been uh, really been popular for a long time. And that just speaks to the 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 sort of quality of the flowers um, in, in terms of a judging perspective. And, and uh, you know, basically, like I said, right out of the jungle, some of these guys, uh, without even line breeding, are, are just these flawless flowers and uh, great shape, really nice color. So uh, it is it was used heavily in breeding, and uh, and like you said, it's in the background of of a lot of hybrids and stuff. Nice. Yeah, I'm excited for mine to bloom. Hopefully, it'll be within a few years yeah yeah um well it looks like we got a guy on our list and a catley on our list that is uh not really limited to one specific season how do we say this one catley allolorii um also used to be uh a lelia and it is a really cool little uh, the flowers are about this big. They're, they're really cupped. So when you look at the flower head on, it looks like this. But when you look at it from the side, it kind of looks like this. Okay. Uh, it's, it's like it doesn't, you know, a flat flower kind of looks like this. Right. This one is more um, clam shaped or, 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 or what have you. Cupped, I guess, is the proper term. Um, uh, no real fragrance on those, guys. It's a very small plant. It might get this tall out, out of the... Um, the whole plant? The whole plant. Um, wow so okay. it's about this big and the flowers are almost the same size you know oh really, that's nice it's a really cool one it's got a shallow root system it's going to want to stay a, a wetter than uh, your typical cat lays you don't really want that one to dry out you don't want your conditions to be soggy of course but you want to keep that a little wetter and it grows a little shadier than, than some of these other cat layers. Um, seems like this would be one that a lot of the mini cat breeding would have come from um, you would think so. It, it, it is just being noticed as a, it's a really cool breeder in that it is basically recessive for everything but size. So if you take, uh, you know, Catlea A and you breed it with Alloria, it's just going to take Catlea A and miniature And make it, it smaller. And make it smaller. And, You're going to have many versions of, oh, that's awesome, it's, actually. It's bizarre how, like, you don't see any influence from Alloria except for the size in the, in the primary hybrids it's it's really cool nice might be breeding some mini rexes up here then <laughs> oh yeah absolutely you know and you could get them blooming more more than just once a year you know oh 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 my gosh yeah let's do it yeah <laughs> <laughs> now do you have this species i do i do so uh if you're collecting pollen and i get my little guys to to bloom um i could put it on that i've also got a friend uh who i ended up giving uh my particular clone of and then she got it awarded um and so you know we could we could throw some rex pollen on that one that would be pretty cool (laughs) exciting all right well we've been through all four seasons we talked about several uh species and uh hope that hopefully this has been useful i know it's been very interesting for me it was a while before i realized wait a minute you can have them blooming all year round why wouldn't you do that (laughs) yeah absolutely and just the species you don't even have to get into the hybrids you know and um, I feel like a lot of folks, as as they they go on, they they sort of specialize in the species, and so. Um, it, I know that a lot of the uh, big companies like Hauserman, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to do this thing like Orchid of the Month, and you would get a Cattleya in bloom every. They would no, it'd be in bud, and you'd get one in the mail all year round, one once a month every year. You'd get one in the mail. I do you'd remember a, that. I don't. I don't. I don't know if anybody still does that. You'd think they would, but, um, you know, getting a, a cat lay every month, I guess you would run out of space kind of quickly. Yeah, Unless you have that's a lot true. Of space. After a year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then the plants get bigger too. Yep. All right. Well, uh, Stephen Camp and Lewis, it has been a pleasure, sir, as usual, talking to you about Cali orchids through the year. Yeah. Good to chat and, uh, and we'll have to do it again soon. Definitely. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time. See ya.